You are listening to the Lawyer Stories Podcast with host Benny Gold. Lawyer Stories was founded in July 2017 on Instagram and is an expanding global network of lawyers and law students sharing their personal journeys to the noble profession of the practice of law. Join us on this podcast as we dig deeper into these stories and hear from lawyers and law students from around the world in all areas of the legal profession. Here at Lawyer Stories, we believe that every lawyer has a story. What's yours? Welcome to the Lawyer Stories podcast with Benny Gold. Uh, today we welcome in Leah N. Miller, MBA, founder and CEO of LNM Financial Services, a fractional CFO for law firms focused on growth, uh, located in Fort Myers, Florida, but helping firms everywhere. Leah, how are you? I'm really good. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, for sure. I'm excited to talk, uh, talk finance with you. Um, so before we get into it, uh, I just want to give a shout out to our friends at Lex Reception. Uh, they're going to give law firms more time, uh, less admin, uh, and you can switch off knowing that your calls are going to be covered by our friends at Lex Reception. From answering calls and messages in real time to appointment scheduling, your clients are going to receive the care and support they need. Uh, their legal answering specialists are going to be on hand 24-7, so you're never going to miss a call or a future case or a future client. Uh, They could do custom scripting and software that can seamlessly integrate with your current workflow. Uh, Lex will make sure that every client gets fantastic service uh, from your very first call. And if you tell them uh, you're with Lawyer Stories and part of our community, you will get $250 off uh, your first month. So thank you to the kind people at Lex Reception. And Leah, let's let's talk back to you. How are things in Florida? Things are good. It's warming up. We were a little good. cold last week. Okay. Um, I know there was a conference down here and I had some clients from up north who were like, it's cold in Florida. But this week we're back up in the 80s and it's warm and it's good. It's January. Yeah. And no, that's good. awesome. I know, yeah, that's uh, that's what I hear. It, it was cold, but it's warming up. So that that is great. Um, and you're in, are you originally, are you like a Floridian? Tell us where you're from. I am. I was born in St. Pete, Florida, but I've lived in cool. Cape Coral since I was three. I left for college for a little bit. I went to college in Orlando for a little bit. Um, nice. I did six months in Missouri. It was way too cold there. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah, I lived two miles from where I went to high school. And, oh, that's awesome. Uh, that's cool. Yeah, so, like, so. You, know, you, could, you know, you could give back to your community that way. You see yeah. people out, you know, you could help them out, whatnot. Yeah, it's like 36 degrees where I am in Massachusetts, but don't worry about little old us here with that 80 degree weather. (laughs) But uh, so like, just curious, like, were you always a math person? Like, why did you decide to go get an MBA? I have always kind of been a math person. Um, I, you know, went away to college when I was 17. I thought I was going to be an ER doctor, you know, within like eight, nine years, whatever it may be, and had all these big plans. And then you get to college and it doesn't always work out that way. So I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, and then when I came back in, home and started going to our local college after a couple of years away, I met somebody that worked at a law firm and I needed a job. And yep. so I started there. I The first day I always tell everybody, I, hear, I heard the word interrogatory and I was like, what? What is uh, this? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And so I was working at a law firm and I'm like, this is, I love this. It was great. Really? And so, was it a yeah, small until, firm or no? It was, it was a small par- firm. We did um, hip defense and some personal injury. And so I just realized like, I really liked it. I really believed in, you know, the legal field. And so I switched my major to paralegal studies. What, what did you like about it? I'm just curious. Like, what did you like about the being? You know, I just, I'm, I'm big on like, everybody has, you know, rights under the law. Everybody has the right to representation by a lawyer um and i just you know i believe in that i just th- find the work interesting i've mostly worked in personal injury um so that's always exciting and fun and there's you know a lot of kind of mixes the medical part in because yep. i was interested in the medical part at one point 
Um, so yeah, I don't, I just, I liked it. And it was one of those things where I finally figured out what I wanted to do because when you're 17, you don't always know what you want to do. Yeah. 27 (laughs) and 37. You don't always know what you want to do. That too, that too. But (laughs) yeah. And then, you know, then I was like, okay, I want to manage a law firm one day. That was like the goal. I figured like when I was in my forties, which seemed really old at the time, not now. Um, I was like, maybe I'll manage a law firm because at that point I had my paralegal degree. And I worked at a personal injury firm and I was right place, right time, amazing boss. Um, And our office manager quit and I looked at him and I was 27 and I said, I can manage your law firm. And he was like, okay, let's do it. Nice. (laughs) Um, So I got a crash course in QuickBooks. And at that point I was finishing up my degree in business management, my bachelor's. Um, and so I decided to go back and get my MBA just for myself. Also, I, I honestly didn't think I was ever going to leave that firm. I just figured that was going to be it. You know, I wanted to manage a law firm, um, but I went back and got my MBA. I love education. And I, so that's why I got my MBA and yeah, I've always had that financial, like I've just been into budgeting. I worked in a bankruptcy for a little bit and I love the budgeting part and right. the financial part of it. So do you, um, did you ever consider law school? I did at one time. Um, and then, you know, it, because it took me a little bit longer to graduate than others did, uh, mostly cause I was just trying to find my way. I, I was at that age, like I got married and, you know, it was kind of like, do I want to go to law school or do I just want to, you know, keep working in the legal field and start a family and all of that stuff. And, um, I'm glad I did what I did. I would not want to go to law school now. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And people always ask, they're like, why don't you go to law school? Because, you know, I, I worked in the field for ten, over 10 years. 10 I years, do yeah. the work. Um, but no, I like I like the management part of it more than anything. So well, it's actually um, cool because you did you were uh, a CFO and a paralegal for 10 years at a law firm. So now with your own business, you definitely have like you're helping law firms, you found a niche and you, you know how to integrate the two, like the finance and the, the law firm. Do you exclusively work with law firms? I don't. So, um, a little backstory. I was the firm administrator and CFO of a personal injury firm while still doing paralegal work. Um, and I started doing some bookkeeping and kind of financial stuff, um, on the side, um, started working with a friend who's, uh, owns a local law firm. And, and I realized there was such a need for the financial, in the financial area for law firms. Um, And so that started growing last year and my commute had gotten a little bit long and I have three kids. And so it just wasn't working driving back and forth to the office. And so back in May, 2023, I quit my job full time and started um, my business. So when I first started, I was doing bookkeeping and whatever for anybody. Cause at the time, like I needed to get, you know, yeah. business in. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Um, yeah. But I knew that law firms were going to be my focus because like you said, I worked in a law firm. I was a paralegal. I know the ins and outs, the day to day of a law firm. Um, so now I primarily focus on law firms um, or law firm adjacent companies, you know, like consultants and things like that. I work with some, um, I'll work with people outside of the legal industry, but for right now, yeah, that's, that's pretty much where I'm focused on. Okay. So like, when did you know it was time to start your own business? Oh, it's, it kind of happened. Like it's actually February of 2023. So we're coming up on one year since that's I started right. it. Congratulations. Um, I, you know, I have a really good friend who had started a business that I worked with at the law firm and she had started a landscaping business with her boyfriend the year before and had quit her law firm job. And so, you know, she kept kind of encouraging me like, you know, you want to do this. And I had mentioned wanting, you know, maybe I'll do a bookkeeping business. And so she really pushed it. And then I started seeing, like I said, the need for it. And I was like, okay, maybe, you know, maybe this is the thing. So I'm like, I'll do it part-time because quitting my full-time job was, you know, like scary. I didn't want to do that. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, I'll do it part-time for a couple of years. We'll see what happens. And it started building and I was like, right. okay, maybe, maybe this, you know, and so. It, so were you it like, okay, fast. were you, was your mindset like, okay, like if I leave this job and just do this full-time, I can take on like double the clients. Is that what happened? 
pretty much okay. yeah right. yeah it was like i was i was doing you know the side work but i wasn't able to meet with anybody during the day and right, I was, right. you know i was kind of spinning my wheels at night and i saw that there was the need um and so i actually did some work for my friend that has the landscaping company when i first quit to kind of supplement things Yep. Until I brought in enough clients. You were, wait, you were doing landscaping work? Well, no, I wasn't. Oh, doing okay. I was doing like financial stuff. The for financial her, stuff. For her yeah, so no, like was... when you were, were you at the law firm when you were about to switch over to your own business? Yeah. So I was so working you like, my own business. While were you I'm like going firm. to your car at lunch and like doing work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. yeah. I was doing it at night and on lunch and, you know, it was, and I, I was never like, I don't come from people that were entrepreneurs. My husband doesn't really come from people that were entrepreneurs. So like at first he wasn't so sure about it either. Cause yeah. I was, you know, on my computer all the time and I was spending hours working on my website and doing all of that. Right, right. He's like, well, I don't get it. And I'm like, just give me six months. And I promise you, this is going to pay off. So like, if you, if I you just work hard, <laughs> if you don't come from a family of entrepreneurs and a lot of people don't, um, like what motivated you to keep going with that? Like when you were, you know, when your husband was there and he has a regular, like a job and like, and you, you know, and then you're, you know, you're, you have a probably a stable job, like doing like the mm -hmm. finances and like, you have this drive, right? So like you're waking up in the morning, you're doing things. I mean, I know sort of about it cause that's sort of how I operate morning, noon and night, whenever I have like, not at the regular job. Um, so, and then at lunch, you're going to your car and you're like crunching numbers, you know, and then at night you're like working on your website, you're watching like, you know, a TV show and you're sitting on the, I don't know. This is just like, me yeah, yeah. Kind of like <laughs> no, that's it. exactly how it was. You know, um, I feel like COVID started changing it, which is probably such a cliche thing that people say now, but we worked from home for six months during that time yep. and I was home with my kids. So I had yeah, a that was six tough, month old. Right? a four-year-old and a six-year-old during okay. COVID. Yep. And so I was home with them and I was able, I still worked from home. I was running a, you know, law office, but I was home with them. We were able to get to their activities and all of that. And then we went back to work. I'm like, okay, it's, I, I love my career. I want to do my career. Um, and then September, 2022, our area was hit by a hurricane. And so our office flooded. We had two feet of water in our law office. And so. Wow. Yeah, that was fun. That was oh, that's water's fun. the worst. I mean, it, <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yeah. So we were home. That was September. We were home until January working from home again. And again, I was able to pick my kids up from the bus and bring them to their appointments. And I'm like, I remember driving one day and thinking, I need to create the life that I want. And the life that I want is my career because it's important to me. It always has been. And being available for my kids. So like, what can I do? And so as I started this side business, I'm like, wait, I can work for myself. I can be available for my kids and still get, you know, make the money that I need to make because obviously everybody has to, you know, make money and get the satisfaction that I have with my career. And so that's really what it was, was I kept having these thoughts like, I need to create the life that I want. And the life that I want is I need a lot more flexibility. And I had great bosses that were flexible, but I managed the law office. I couldn't be, I couldn't work from home all the time when the staff was in the office. Like we were not remote or anything like right. that. So that was really the drive was that time with my kids. So I picked my kids up from the bus every single day at 3.30. And that's what my calendar works around. For the most part, I'm done working at 3.30. And then after they go to bed, I'm back on the computer if I need yep. to, if there's something I need to, yep. you know, do. Um, the months of November and December when they were off for the holidays, I was not working all that much, you know, during the day. And I was kind of doing it when I could. Right, and so right. that's the life that I want. And so that's kind of the drive of it. That's awesome. Well, congratulations on almost a Thank year uh, coming up in February. That's your true hustler. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so like, so let's get into more like the finance piece right now. So we've covered, <laughs> no, this is, this is awesome. I love your story. I think you really have like a tremendous story of like, you know, working, being an entrepreneur, becoming an entrepreneur, working morning, noon, and night, whenever you had the free minute, you know, and just making it happen, taking the jump. Like that's the biggest yeah. thing that some people just won't do. You know, they yeah. won't take the jump. Um, so you're a specialist in budgeting and financial planning for law firms. 
Yes. Why is this so important for law firms? So especially for law firms that are focusing on growth, um, it's really important to one, have your basic financials. And so, you know, um, I post a lot on LinkedIn and I don't always post a lot about bookkeeping, but I do like, that's kind of how it started. And so I'm big on having that firm foundation of your financials and doing it in a way so that you can use the data to make decisions. Um, so I tell people all the time, you know, there's bookkeeping for tax purposes, which is important. You need to do that. But you can take it a little bit further, take it a step further and do it in a way where you can take that information and make decisions. Um, and that's, you know, how much are we paying our attorneys? How much are we paying our associates? How much are we paying our paralegals? Like breaking those categories down so you can really analyze what you're spending your money on. Um, and then taking that a step further with law firms that are focused on growth, just knowing the numbers and the data so that you can make decisions on, can we spend money this month on whatever this is that we need to do, or do we need to wait a little bit? Um, law firms are kind of a unique um, you know, specialty because like my landscaping friend, they can, if they need to hustle and make some money this week, they can go out and hustle and make some money. But if you're right. a personal injury attorney and you have a case come in this week, you're not gonna see that money for six, 12, 18 months. Yep. And so you really have to plan this out and look at what does my next six months look like? What and so this is what kind of distinguishes like? you from like somebody else who's doing other bookkeeping and other like finance work and helping It's like you're, you know, you know, the law firms, you know, a personal injury firm, you know, okay, that's great. You got a case, but like, let's, let's look at your budget and forecast that for like the next six, 12, 18 months. Right. Yeah. Are you working with only personal injury or is it other type of firms? No, I'm, I'm working with all types of firms. I have several personal injury firms just because that's kind of, you know, what I've talked about the most. Yep. Um, no, you know, we look at it. Um, I work with an estate planning firm a lot. And so that's a little different. You're able to, you bring a client in today. A lot of times you get paid right away or you see that, you know, uh, money come in in two months. Um, but in a lot of times with those kind of firms, we look at, you know, you have a revenue goal of a million dollars this year. Right. Well, what does that look like? Let's break it down by month, by how many clients you need to see. And a lot of times that's eye opening. It's, you know, I'll tell people you need to close 30 clients a month to reach your revenue goal. And they're like, but I'm only closing 15 right now. Like, right. Okay. Well, what can we do to bring in those extra clients? Do we need to right. spend more money on marketing? Do we need to update our processes to get more clients closed. Like, what does that look like? Do we have to hire somebody? So, um, you know, that's kind of the nitty gritty that we get into a lot of the times. Okay. So, you know, I've always heard that, and, and when you say like closed clients, are you, you're not really talking about personal injury, right? Cause you could, you never, no, yeah, no, that would be, you know, get. like an estate, estate planning. planning. Okay. To, All right. So, and yeah. you know how much they charge and you know, yeah. what you, right. So it's easier yeah. to sort of forecast. Yeah. So tell us about, you know, I've heard, the, I always hear the term like bookkeeper. Oh, hey, we have a bookkeeper. Like we have a bookkeeper, you know, what, like, what is it, <laughs> excuse me, what does it mean to like be a bookkeeper? So I like to explain to everybody because then people are like, what's a fractional CFO and what's a, Well, that's you know, another a question of... I'm going to ask <laughs> later. I or think. a lot of people yes, are like. Yes, that's actually the next question, but I want to learn <laughs> about what of... a bookkeeper is now. Is it the same so thing? a lot of people are like, I need a CPA. So this is how I explain it. Your bookkeeper is looking at the past and they're categorizing all of your transactions that are coming in. They're reconciling your bank account, making sure what you have in your accounting system matches what the bank has on the bank statement, which is really important to do every month because shocking, the bank doesn't always get it right. Um, and so you just want to make sure you have all of that data coming in. And so that's what the bookkeeper does. And like I said, I like to take bookkeeping to the next level where I don't categorize it just for tax purposes. I like to categorize it so that you can use that data to make decisions and to, you know, break it down in a way that it makes sense. Um, so that's really what a bookkeeper does. Yeah, I mean, I thought the bookkeeper was like, oh, hey, like we got, we just got like a $500 check. We have to put that on the ledger. That sort yeah. of thing. Is that like yeah. what it is? Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I don't, I don't necessarily like pay bills or anything. Normally, you know, my clients have people that pay their bills in office 
and then I'm categorizing them in QuickBooks okay. and just making, you know, I'm, I'm preparing and building out their financial statements that okay. they then give to their CPA who's going to file their taxes or, you know, do okay. whatever they want with them. So. Okay. So I think the concept of fractional CFO, and you were right, you're very predictable, I guess, um, <laughs> is also like really cool. It's really the first time I've heard it, but I think there's, you know, there's, there's things out there that are now like synthesized, you know, and like, like fractional CFO is definitely something that's interesting. Like, tell us what your process like um, is like, like when you go to a law firm for the first time, like, what do you do? So fractional, you know, CFO is in the firm in, if you have a full-time CFO, they're overseeing the financials, doing the planning, the forecasting, things like that. And so it costs a lot of money to have a full-time CFO. And a lot of firms don't need it when they're, you know, in the growth, smaller growth stages. Um, so fractional is just, I'm, I'm available on a fractional basis, on a monthly basis. Um, and so what I do is I start with my clients. Is that like a, I'm sorry, I don't mean, I'm not trying to cut you. I, I don't cut people off, but I'm curious, like fractional like do they use that term in math because it's like a math term like you could say like part-time or like no <laughs> there's there is a new there it's a big thing like fractional coo and okay, fractional right. cmo gotcha. so you can just get those like higher level c-suite with the education and the experience but you're not paying you know a couple yeah, i guess that was like a little bit of a dad joke actually yeah <laughs> i can't really escape them but so, all right. So tell us what you look for. You go into a law firm, you're, you're just hired. What are you looking for the first time? So my basis and what I do with all of my clients is I talk to them about their goals first, because, you know, a lot of people, they're like, well, what are, I just want to know the industry standards for how much I'm supposed to spend on marketing. And it's like, but what's your goal? Because that's, what's going to drive how you should work with your financials. So I really sit down and we talk about goals. Do we have revenue goals? Do we need to pay off debt? Do we want to hire more attorneys, hire more staff? Are you just kind of drowning and don't know what's happening and you're making money, but you don't have any profit and you just want more profit? What are your goals? And so we kind of look at that. I look at their past financials, profit and loss, balance sheet, all of that. And I like to take an educational approach. So I want people to under, I want law firm owners to look at a profit and loss and understand what it means. I don't need you to get into it, the nitty gritty of it, because that's why you're hiring me. But I want you to be able to know the basics of what it means to look at that. Yeah. Um, so we look at that. And then based on those goals, we write up a budget for the year. What's wow. our budget? What does that look like? You know, what's our revenue goal? Let's break that down. Like I said, how many clients do you need to bring in the door? And how many cases do you need to close to hit that revenue goal? Um, and then we look at expenses. Are there expenses that we need to cut? Are there, um, you know, what's, what are your expenses um, compared to your revenue? How much are your, you know, your wages compared to your revenue? Do we need to make changes there? Um, a lot of times I have to encourage people to spend money. It's like, yeah, do you, what's like the biggest thing that you find? Like that, like right away, is there like a trend? Um, like the wages are, you know, people that are struggling with net profit mm -hmm. and not having enough profit, wages are the first thing I look at. Because if you're running at 50% of your revenues going to wages, then you're overstaffed. And so then people will be like, no, we're not. Everybody's really busy. It's like, okay, then let's talk about your processes because okay. you don't have a staff issue at this point. You, you should be able to run a law firm with, you know, that staff. What are your processes? Is there something wrong? Do we need to look at how people are, you know, and I don't necessarily get into the operations processes, but since I have the experience and I've hired people and fired people and set yeah. up processes, I can give my opinion of something's wrong here. Um, you know, a lot of times people aren't spending enough money on, you know, their marketing. That's really low. So I have to encourage people sometimes to spend money um, on that. And then, you know, getting into that debt cycle. Sometimes we need to pay off some debt because we don't have the cash flow. And so, you know, then we start getting into like cash flow and looking at cash flow and what okay. that looks like. And incidentally, like, I don't really know like the composition of your clients, obviously, but do you see like a different trend between maybe an older person law firm and like a younger person law firm? Like, like what they like what they're doing like 
in terms of like maybe like the younger person spending a lot on like you know social media ads and the older person's like not spending enough or something like that yeah and there's um you know and i have a lot of mostly like younger clients who are into you know the growth and things like that and doing things differently because those are the people that are going to seek me out um you know you do see a trend with older clients old school law firms that may not be paying their staff what you know other places are paying you know and that's there's a big okay. variance in like what a paralegal is paid all over the country like it's oh, so really? yeah. oh yeah and so like you'll see that but most of the clients that i'm working with are clients that are growth minded they want to grow they want to do things different they're you know a lot of them are running their law firm as a business and that's why they're looking for that extra guidance yeah and that's probably why they hire you you know they yeah. want to get ahead and do things different yeah. Um, and you work nationwide, like give us a, yeah. an example of like where. Yeah. Like, so I have like two clients in Florida and the okay. rest of them are all over the country. I've That's got amazing. clients. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've got clients in California and I make it okay. work with the time difference. Yep. Um, I've, I have a bunch of clients up near you. I have a couple in I think New Jersey. I have okay. some in Massachusetts. So okay. um, I've got a bunch up near you middle of the country um i randomly have three that are in missouri that came from different places yeah, so why not hey. um, but yeah i have i have two in florida yep. um yep. and i really well i have three i have one booking being client that's local also that's a law firm um and i really prefer the ones that are all over the place because i like meeting with clients on zoom sometimes it's easier because then i can yeah. share my screen and show yeah the financials yeah. whereas when you're meeting face to face sometimes it's harder yeah to, to make a presentation kind of right? that. yeah yeah totally. yeah so. that, makes, that makes a lot of sense um yep. so tell us what uh should law firm owners look at when they're reviewing their revenue generated uh and profitability so the biggest thing to look at for revenue is how quickly we're getting that revenue in. So if okay. you're a personal injury firm, what are our processes to get cases to closure? Um, okay. Sometimes you don't have control over that. Obviously, if it goes to trial, you don't have control over that. But there is some element of control. Um, you know, if we're talking about estate planning, family law, criminal law, getting those invoices out collecting on those invoices like a lot of times that just gets forgotten mm -hmm. which is kind of you know random um but just getting getting that process in place and having that process to actually bring the revenue in is so big um and then understanding how to get to your revenue goal like i said i've had tons of conversations in the last couple of weeks because we're at the beginning of the year where I've broken down what it means, like what they have to actually bring in to hit their revenue yeah. goal. Yep. And it was eye opening to everybody because they're like, whoa, that's a lot. Right, right. Like that's, you know, you can say all day long, I'm going to hit $2 million this year. But if you don't actually know what that means and aren't striving towards, hey, did we get it done this month? Are we getting it done next month? Then you're not going to hit that revenue goal. It's There's not really a plan there. Um, And then profitability, I'm big on, being aware of your expenses. I talk a lot about how people kind of, they sign contracts for marketing stuff or like this, you know, whatever they do and they don't ever look at them again. And it's just on auto pay and they're just right, right, going right. through the motions. Like know what your expenses are. Look at your profit and loss statement and see where all of your money is going. Because if you're not getting in there and looking at it and looking at it, on a regular basis so yeah. if whoever's preparing your financials isn't giving them to you until you know the 31st of the next month you really can't do anything about it because that happened 60 days ago right um, so just regularly looking at those expenses and knowing what they are um and taking you know inventory of those that's really important for profitability and knowing what you want your goals to be there also have you seen anything crazy that like law firms spend on or like that? It's just like, what are you doing? Or like, not really. No, okay. <laughs> no I haven't seen anything too crazy. 
um, you know, some people will spend a lot of money on marketing and, yep. and that's fine. Like there's industry benchmarks of like, you know, people say to spend 10 to 15% or whatever it is. And I've seen where people are like, no, spend 20 to 30% on marketing to get those in. Yep. And I'm okay with that. If that's your goal. Um, no. And my clients are pretty good. Not many of them are, you know, heavy on the expenses. They do really good. Like I said, sometimes I have to tell people to spend money. Yeah. Like, hey, you, yeah. you need to spend money. Is that usually um, the older, older attorneys? No, no, no. Oh, no, really? Okay. No, no, no. They, you know, some of them are, they're just really good with money and they're conservative with money. Why, what do you tell them to spend? Like, why do they have to spend it? What do you tell them to spend? To bring it? in more case. Like if you want to bring in more cases. Oh, you mean on like marketing spend. or something? Yeah. Marketing. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, and even hiring, you know, like you can only, you max out at some point, you can only handle so many cases. True. It's true. You're going to have to bring in another attorney. It's true. And so like, let's talk about what that looks like bringing in another attorney. And so balancing, you know, that I was, I actually did a post the other day about for growth, you need the marketing and you need to be able to close cases. So you need to hire more people. That's right. And if you do too much marketing and you don't have enough people, you can't handle the cases you're bringing in. If you have too many people and not enough marketing, you have people sitting around waiting for cases. So it's like finding that balance. It's like being an owner, you know, it's like, it's how do you get that going? You know, it's like, yeah, it's some time. And, really that and that's what having somebody like me that's on the outside who, yep. while I like, I root for my clients, I want my clients to win. I don't necessarily like I'm not emotionally attached to it like they are. Um, and so I'm on the outside and I can say like, hey, you know, we need we need to pull back a little bit here. We need to spend a little bit there or right. we need to change up this process a little bit, um, you know, on that. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's it's an objective point of view. It really helps them out. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any tips for us for like cost cutting at a law firm? Um. You know, the biggest tip, like I said, is just making sure those reoccurring contracts and subscriptions are under control. Um, I'm seeing right now, especially because there's this big push, you know, on LinkedIn and stuff like that for growth and all these conferences and all of that and softwares. And I feel like you can get bogged down with mm. softwares and conferences and all of that, wow, which is so fine. Much. So much. <laughs> it's fine. But just make sure that what you're doing is intentional and you're being strategic about it. You know, I don't, right. people like, it's funny cause they almost get ashamed sometimes talking to me about like money. Like I'm going to judge them on what they're spending their money on. And I like, I literally have no judgment. Like I, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me at all. And I'm like, I don't care how you spend your money. I just want you to be intentional. I want you to plan mm -hmm. for it. I want you to know where it's going and I want you to be smart about it. So like, Yes, go go spend all that money on that conference if you want. I don't care. As long as the money's there, you're going to be able to make payroll and you're getting something out of it. Right. Well, make sure you can get up the next day when you go to the happy hour, you know, and like yeah. go, to, go to the <laughs> sessions, you know, go to the sessions. Yeah. That work. Get something out of it. You know, don't miss yes. don't miss breakfast and lunch, right? That's yes. <laughs> yeah. um so <clears throat> what's important when looking at cash flow? like in law firms, like what, what are you looking at? Like when you're, are you like, all right, you know, like, I, I actually don't really know, what there, <laughs> but like, what, what are you looking at? Being aware of, especially, you know, in a personal injury firm, I, I always go back to that because you can have a really good month this month and then you can have two months of nothing. So you need to be aware of that and right. not take all that profit this month and be like, Hey, we settled a big case. I'm going to go have fun now. That's right. Um, so being aware of what's coming up. And so traditionally people use, you know, um, historical data and mm -hmm. averages to kind of plan out the future. Sure. Yep. Smart. I like that. I, I do that. You know, we budget. Right? Yeah. We throw yeah. out the biggest case. We come up with your average per case and we tell you how much, you, how many you need to do. But at the same time, I encourage my clients to actually look at what they have in their firm and what's actually available to settle. So, you know, I encourage my personal injury clients to look at their cases that are pending and think, what are they going to settle for? When are they going to settle? And just being aware of that so we can use the historical and we can use what you actually have to kind of plan for that cash flow. So if we know 
March and April are going to be kind of lean months. Let's be a little smart going into March and April. And then we'll see where we are in May and maybe make, you know, that big purchase. Or if you're, you know, one of the big things is bringing on a new associate and what that costs for people, you know, that's, that's a big cost to bring on an associate. So I always encourage people, don't just think about the salary and can you make that salary? What do you expect that associate to do? Are they going to be generating their own revenue? How long right. until they start generating their own revenue? Are they bringing a book of business maybe? Exactly. Exactly. Are you floating their salary for six months and then you expect them to be, you know, generating their own revenue after that? Um, you know, just making those kind of plans and all of that is cash flow and just, again, being super aware of what's coming in and what's going out. And, and so you're actually that- it more often. That, that kind of uh, posed another question. Like what size firms are you working with? I, I don't think I asked that yet. No. So my sweet spot right now is firms that are generating between about a million to 6 million. Wow. Um, anything more than that becomes a little corporate and I want to, you know, keep that personal touch that I have. Firms, I have a lot of bookkeeping clients that are smaller firms that are kind of growing from 500,000 to a million. And I think people in that category need help. They don't necessarily, they can't necessarily afford like the full fractional CFO services that I offer yep, that yep. like a $3 million firm. So I try to work with those people with the bookkeeping part. And like I said, I do bookkeeping in a way that they can kind of do the CFO right, stuff right. themselves. Um, and so I always encourage people, even if you don't think you can afford my monthly services, talk to me and let's see how like we can you know work together because you have a menu like a different help. like a different thing that you um just i try of... to do a consultation and talk to people okay. and see like where they're at and then give them a proposal i do so you'll cater packages. it to each firm like you'll yeah cater. okay yeah yeah and i have packages that i base it off of and like set prices that i base it off of but like I said, I I don't want to discourage a firm that's making seven hundred thousand dollars a year from calling me, because I can offer them a bookkeeping package with a quarterly CFO call, mm. and charge them for the quarterly call. Right. And so they're still getting that. It's just not the monthly. You know, my full monthly clients. I've got Slack. They email me. They like they get a lot of access to me. Yeah. Whereas other clients get a little bit less. So. Got it. Okay. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so, all right, we know the size. Um, so I think you have like a special skill with not only the bookkeeping, but, you know, because personal injury law, it's hard to sort of predict like what's going to come in, what the settlement's going to be, if it's going to go to trial. So to be able to be a bookkeeper is really kind of uh, a special skill. I mean, would you say, I mean, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. You're, you're able to go in there and help them because, you know, unless you're really floating and getting like a lot of, maybe these firms do, like they get a lot of settlements like every day, <laughs> um, you know, you're going to need to know how to like manage the money over time. So yeah. That's, that's yeah. Cool. Yeah. And it's not something that you learn in law school because, you know, you're learning how to be a lawyer and a lot of people who are practicing law, that's what they want to do. They don't, people don't want to look at the books. And I think a lot of times because they don't understand the finances. Mm -hmm. And so they're just kind of like, they just like, if we don't look at it, it doesn't exist. There's right, enough money in the right, bank to right. get us through today. So, you know, right. that's what I find. That's right. So what do you see like a common error amongst these firms a lot of the time? I think a lot of times just not being aware of what's coming in and what's going out is okay. a common error. Yep. Um, I've seen some really interesting trust accounts. <laughs> um, so, and you know, that's obviously something I specialize in is trust accounting because I've really done it tell us about so that. Um, so Florida is really picky. I guess there's other States that don't really care about your trust account is what I'm learning, but there's other States that are just as picky as Florida. Mm -hmm. Um, so people will hire me to, you know, they don't, they start their firm. They don't really know anything about the finances. They don't know what reconciling the bank accounts means. And they're like a year or two down the road and they've never really reconciled their trust account and they're kind of tracking it. You know, a lot of most firms are trying to track it. Um, so I'll go in and clean up their trust accounts, set it up in their case management software, QuickBooks, the way that they need it set up. 
Um, and then ongoing bookkeeping for the trust account. So you're supposed to do a three-way reconciliation. You need to know what each client has in the trust account, make sure the trust account's yep. balancing the book, you know, the bank statements. Um, and I don't, that's not something that bookkeepers that aren't in the legal field understand to the extent that you should, or, you know, somebody will just be like, oh, I'm going to have my CPA do that. And I find like a lot of tax CPAs, because I know taxes, they don't necessarily know the ins and outs of those trust accounts like they okay. should. Okay. Um, and so I've seen some really interesting trust accounts um, and I'll go in and clean them up. And that's normally a project basis where I'll like wow. quote them a, you know, project fee for that and clean it up. I encourage people when they start a firm to get it set up from day one, yeah. because it is going to cost you a lot more money to get me to clean it up than it would have cost you to hire me on a monthly basis from day one. Wow. So. You don't do any investing. Like, do you, do you, um, no, okay. No, 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 I don't or like when that. people, no, I mean, not investing, but like if somebody says, you know, what kind of account should I keep this bucket of money in? Like my, oh, yeah, we'll talk about like, that sort of thing. Not yeah, like, we'll talk about like, like putting it in our high time, yield like, savings. Yeah. Okay. You'll talk about that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We'll talk about like putting in a high yield savings and okay. moving money around. And I have a, several clients who do profit first. I don't know if you know what that is. Um, and so, you know, we'll talk about moving things between bank accounts and, um, okay. you know, a lot of firms now are going towards um, getting lines of credit through certain um, funding companies for their case costs, this personal injury. And so, you know, we look at that and talk about that and how to, you know, what we're going to pay back for that and things like that. So, okay, got it. Yeah. Um, so what advice do you have for law firms that are starting to grow? I think the biggest thing financially is to know your goal and know what that goal means to you personally and for the business. So, you know, I can say I want to make a million dollars this year, but what's a million dollars going to get me? And so that's the big goal is like, what do you want your firm to look like? What do you want to do in the future? I have clients who want to work less, but make the same amount of money. So they have to hire a bunch of people and their profits a little bit lower. I have other clients who want to maximize their profit. They want to work a normal amount, but they don't want to do any of the legal work. So they have to hire attorneys to do the legal work. And so just knowing your goals is the foundation for your financials because it's going to be different for everybody. You can read all the books, you can watch all the videos, and it's going, you can have three law firms with the same amount of attorneys doing the same kind of work, and they could have completely different financials and financial goals because it's really all dependent on the goals. So I think when you're thinking about growth, know what you want that growth to look like and then also be flexible in it as well. I always tell everybody like, you have to be flexible. You have to make changes along the make way. Change. You got to do like a little budget revision in there. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so like one quote you had on your LinkedIn, where I just want to touch on your LinkedIn because you're, you're like a pillar of LinkedIn. Like you're, you, know, you have amazing posts. You're out there. I see it. We we see you. And um, you, I like the quote that you had. And I think you need to like make not. It wouldn't be a meme, but I guess it'd be like you and like the the pick the the words. Revenue is a roller coaster. Yeah. So I think like what tell us. I mean, I, we've discussed it, but like what I like that quote from Leah Miller. Like, why is revenue a roller coaster? Because it's just so, especially in the legal field, it can be so up and down. You know, even if you have steady clients coming in, it's not always going to be the same every month. And so you just have to make those plans for the right. future so right. that you can get through. So um, it's funny you mentioned my LinkedIn because LinkedIn terrified me back in July. Yeah, I did not post at all. I was like, I don't know how to use LinkedIn. And somebody um, asked me, they're like, where's your ideal client? I'm like on LinkedIn, but I don't know how to post on there. And they're like, yeah. just start posting. And I have literally posted almost every single day since um, I have met some amazing connections yeah. yep. who, you know, are outside of not even going to be clients. Um, and I have conversations with people in DMs. They'll send me questions about yep. my posts and, and I'll talk to them. And so now I tell everybody, I'm like, go, go to my LinkedIn because my goal is to help law firm owners be comfortable in their finances 
and I want to reach as many as them as, as them as I can. So yeah. even if they're not going to be my client, you know, obviously I can only have so many clients. I want to still reach people and help them feel confident in their finances. Yeah, it's amazing. And we'd love to have you teach or be an instructor for Lawyer Stories Connect and talk about it. Yeah, um, at I would some love point, that. like on our platform. Uh, I don't know if you joined it up yet. The link's in our bio on our Instagram. But um, that, yeah, that's amazing. And, and another thing on your LinkedIn, you said um, you believe education never stops. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about that. So I have always been that person that if I want to learn something, I just learn as much as I can about it. Like I yep. know just random facts. Like I wanted chickens recently and I started researching chickens. I can't even have chickens yes. where I live, but I, I know everything really? about chickens now. Um, <laughs> and so I'm just constantly like, there is so much information at our disposal. Like yeah. we can learn everything. It's true. Um, it's true. And I, I just believe in education. So I loved, I loved getting my education. I think it was so important. It's so important to me. Um, I want to, I take the approach with my clients an educational approach. So I don't ever tell people, this is the way it is. This is how you do it. If you want to reach your goal, this is the only way I'm like, Hey, this is why this is this way. This is another option you have. If you choose this, that's what's going to happen. If you choose this, that, and I give options and I'm like, let's talk through it and really learn about it because I want you to understand the why. And I took the same approach when I was a firm administrator. I, I would teach anybody anything. I was never afraid of anybody taking my job. I was very confident in my abilities yeah, and my job. Tell. You can tell. <laughs> well, no, the passion and confidence emanates from you. And that's so important. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's amazing. But, but that's what I would do. Like if our receptionist wanted to learn how to draft a pleading and she had some time, okay, I'll, t I'll teach you how to draft a pleading. Yeah. I'll teach you what that means. Um, and so, and I've actually this semester I'm teaching at the local college. I'm teaching some paralegal classes because that's I believe awesome. in the profession and I just want to give back to it. Right. Um, so I am a believer in education. I will always be educating myself. I'm always listening to business books and reading and just like, if I have a question, I look it up. Yeah. And so I try to take all that information from everywhere. And that's kind of how I gain my opinions. And that's how I help my clients is I come at them from an educational standpoint of let's learn about your finances. Let's be confident in your finances so that you can make great decisions for your firm. That's awesome. Um, congratulations. That's really cool. Thank you. Um, what, so just one more question. Do you ever refer to like, like when you see your client, your legal clients in need, do you, do you make referrals to legal related? Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Okay. I have a, I've um, developed a great network of okay. consultants on LinkedIn. And so I try to refer. Um, and I know that not every client's for me and not every client's for everybody. There's certain personalities. So I'll refer, you know, I, I'm, I've become very close to some people who are consultants and they all kind of do the same thing. But like I've referred certain clients to certain people because I know certain clients are going to mesh well with, you know, other people. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. like, well, this, like legal related businesses and like that sort of thing. Like, you know, we have some, like, if you ever are looking for like a preferred partner, like a business, like you're, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. 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 No, I'm, I'm always yeah. looking to network and find awesome. different ways I can help my clients. So well, we do have a way you can network next month in Miami, if you'd like to take a trip, but we'll talk about that after. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Leah Miller, MBA. Do we have anything else that you'd like to share that maybe we left out today? No, I think that's it. I encourage anybody who wants to connect with me on LinkedIn. Like I said, yeah. I love just sharing tips and tricks on there and I'll talk to anybody anytime um, about, you know, any of that. So definitely check out Leah on LinkedIn. You have an amazing, uh, you know, presence there. You're always uh, writing very thoughtful posts. So we thank, thank you for you. that. And uh, thanks for coming on the Lawyer Stories podcast. Leah Miller, um, owner and founder, founder and CEO of LNM Financial Services, fractional CFO. Thank you so much. Stay right there. Everybody else, wherever you are in the world today, enjoy yourselves. Cheers.